All right. Hello and good evening to people in India. Uh, good morning to those in the US and good afternoon to you guys in Europe and wherever you are in the world, welcome. I'm delighted to be an anchor for this session with uh, Shankar Mahadevan. Uh, we all know Shankar uh, as a celebrated musician, but this conversation is more about his journey as an innovator in an area in which we have all had to become more familiar during the pandemic, online learning. Shankar has become a major innovator in the field of online learning, specifically teaching and having people learn Indian classical music online. Shankar co-founded the Shankar Mahadevan Academy with uh, Sridhar Ranganathan, a seasoned technologist and uh, Shankar's senior, one year senior at the Ram Rao Athik Institute of Technology in 2010. 2010 is when they started the Shankar Mahadevan Academy together. Back then it was a purely online academy but they adopted a blended, blended model for teaching music in 2016. And in these 11 years, the academy has seen spectacular scale of growth by any account. It has served more than 35,000 students, 10,000 of them online in 84 countries. So impressive. And these students range from the age of two, like toddlers, all the way up to, I guess they call it non nonagenarians or something, 94. Okay, so whole range of ages. And these also are, you know, uh, learners who are hobby learners, who are just learning music for um, love of music, as well as those who are preparing for competitions. And as you can imagine, COVID in the last two, three years has presented a whole new set of challenges to both Shankar and to Sridhar. And I spoke to Shankar about how they've gone about it, how they are using their ingenuity, creativity, innovativeness, etc., to expand the realms of what's possible. And I've also talked about uh, Shankar's own journey as a, as a musician and composer and innovator. The SMA, the Shankar Mahadevan Academy, is on the cusp of a very interesting transformation right now. Um, so without much ado, I'd like to start the session. And at the end of the session, if you have any questions for me, I'd be very happy to take uh, one or two, time permitting. Shankar, awesome to see you. Um, Likewise. So <laughs> Awesome. Uh, let me uh, start out uh, right off the bat with uh, SMA, uh, the Shankar Mahadevan Academy and what it does. And I uh, and the listeners want to know how it's evolved with the times since it was founded, especially with COVID now. A little ba background about myself, as you might be knowing, I'm also an engineer and my partner, Sridhar Ranganath, and he's also an engineer. And both of us had this vision of starting uh, something to do with music online which which does not exist in a in a structured manner you know so both of us had this idea when we met and Sridhar being the the tech genius that he is uh, on the on the online space and my knowledge about Indian classical music and details and technicalities of Indian classical music it's very rare that you know art an art form and technology they come together and create something so that's what we decided to do and um, somehow 10 years back or, or almost 11 years back we had this vision that you know this is going to be the future and uh, you know we should we should catch the bus early uh, before you know many other people hop onto it so we uh, decided to and there's a lot of uh, you know back and forth in the sense uh, how to go about it you know so how to start it what kind of a platform do we use a platform like skype or what do we do you know, how do we teach? How do we set up this entire uh, academy online? Uh, because we did not have any reference point. You know, what happens is when you create a particular whatever, you know, company, business, anything, you have something to look up to and say, that, hey, I want to become like this. You know, let's see what is their philosophy? What is their policy? What is uh, what are the principles that these people do? But we did not have anything. We are we are just... Uh, there are only a bunch of people who are in a very disorganized way just teaching music on Skype because they are free and they are at home or whatever, you know. So there's not an, an organized academy is not there, including Berkeley College of Music, mm -hmm. where it's only a bunch of videos which are there. You know, you look at the video and you learn. So uh, Sridhar and me, almost for two, three years, we were just brainstorming about what should be the format of the academy, you know. 
uh, whether it should be just you know a one way interaction whether it should be a two way interaction whether we should just have lots of videos out there which people look and we learn or should we have like a you know two way thing where you know you uh, so eventually after it's it was like jamming for a song you know how you create a song one idea after the other it just i used to go and to my farmhouse in karjat and we used to sit and we used to chat 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 and over the phone early mornings just come up with various ideas and we came up with these different parameters which are kind of the key pillars of the academy so we wanted to create something which apart from that brick and mortar building that is there everything else is available online for you so basically you know a, a textbook which is a one way uh, uh, of seeking knowledge and then the and the teachers that uh, which is a two way interaction thing and then of course we have other added facilities which you do not find in a in a contem- i mean in a regular uh, you know traditional way of teaching is we have things like your every class is recorded and you know you can go back and visit your uh, this thing so these are all ideas one after the other one after the other how do we how do we set up the see what is a curriculum in indian indian classical music curriculum is very vague you know there's nothing like a curriculum the guru comes and says chalo aaj hum rag yaman gaate hain so he it's up to him and he says okay ne re ga ye lagao aadha ghanta lagao and then you go on singing that for half an hour and there's no structure to it you know which is also beautiful in a in a in a in a way but i always wanted to check it out how we can bring about a kind of structure to our great form of music and also by bringing about a structure you are showing a path to the to the to the student when you join the academy today you will know okay in my 17th class i'll be learning this mm-hmm. you already know uh, there's 40 minute 45 minutes of you know learning in that how much or how little are you going to you know uh, bring in as part of your curriculum so first we were very excited we added so much in 45 minutes that oh my god the teachers used to go mad you know trying to squeeze in so many things and you just not able to finish it then we brought it down and we realized that we need some space we need some time to bounce or everything by trial and error so finally now it's a beautifully functioning academy super successful uh, i mean uh, you know that you are successful not only with the money that you make but also from the testimonials you get from your students and the teachers and um, during the covid uh you know as you were asking people realized the the importance and the beauty of learning online you know uh, traditionalists they used to say are yaar ye indian music online kaise sikh sakte it's not possible yaar you need yaar your guru to sit in front of you and this that and all that but then they realized it's possible you know everything is possible now we are having this meeting yeah, uh, yeah really we would have met at land end or something like that or had a had one conference room and we but we are doing it and and it is effective you know, the, the effect is the same and uh, efficiency is also the same so that's what we realized and the number of students uh, shridhar will uh, uh, draw some light into uh, during the covid what was the change that happened shridhar um, uh, we had to shut down seven centers the first thing we did was we want to make sure that none of the people are uh, unemployed or laid off so we kind of train them and move them on to online because we knew that the online will surge and um, uh, one third of our students current students happened in the last two years versus 11 years so that's the kind of surge we saw and uh, we were well prepared for it uh, like shankar said we have class recordings and practice recordings and all the various things people just fell in love with it and we also saw the n- the number of students are leaving the academy has been fewer now in the last two years wonderful well kudos to both of you for uh, having the idea and taking your time to brainstorm about it and uh, come up with this you know i have a happiness class i'm in the business school i teach a wow. class of happiness yeah so i had a you know i was just thinking so many thoughts came to me when you were talking on one of those was i had a similar uh, situation where there was no other happiness class and so i had no template in front of me and i had to create it and as this is amazing i've I'm, i've never heard anything like a happy what happens in the happiness <laughs> well we'll have another interview where you interview me okay <laughs> <laughs> i don't want to get too uh, distracted from this topic if you don't uh, mind uh, so because yeah, no, there are no, so no. many questions we have no uh, because i'll tell you why because the, the 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 tagline of our academy is the joy of music the joy of music. yeah that's right yeah like 
That's all right. Yeah, so yeah. we do have a question on that too a little bit later. So right. uh, let me move on to the second one. Um, how do you get students, okay, especially kids, interested in classical music? Okay, learning to practice the sargam might be challenging, maybe even boring for them. And I can kind of vouch for it. When I was a kid, my father put me in a mirdangam class and I was interested in it, but I wanted to be an expert already, you know? I was yeah, boring yeah. to learn. See, uh, one thing that I did not uh, want with Indian classical music is it's a very intimidating form of music, you know, for some reason. It need not be. We are all mentally programmed that we'll be laughing and the minute we say, uh, you know, you've got to learn Hindu, in, Hindustani or Karnataka classical music, the expression changes. Oh my God. It's, <laughs> oh my God. Oh, teacher has come. Oh yeah. Silence. Don't talk. You know, this, uh, you know, I, I, I understand touching a person's feet and uh, all that is great. It's our culture. But respect is more from the mind, you know. I mean, I really feel. So do not change the mood. You know, music is happiness. Music is joy. So why is it that when we come to Indian classical music, everything changes and it becomes like one Gambhir Paristiti, you know. Like, oh my God, what's happening? Don't, don't, don't mess with it. You know, it's like that. No, it's not that. It's a beautiful world which we want you to come and experience. Now, how do we do that? If I tell a five-year-old today, a person who is, you know, uh, who is very, very uh, savvy, even on his parents, his or her parents' phone, and he knows all the television channels, and he knows all technology, and he is, he is, yeah, it's a fast-moving world. Uh, it's a different time now. And you tell him that, you know, don't make noise. Just sit there and just do Sare Gama. No questions asked. Just keep doing this. In two classes, he'll run away. Yeah. For sure. Not for anything else because we are all in that kind of scenario. The world is changing, you know. So, Sridhar and me, we thought of it. How the first thing that we should, we should uh, change is, not change in the sense what we should apply. I'm, I'm not saying whether anybody is wrong or right. What we should apply is we should make Indian classical music cool. It's cool. It's okay to learn Indian classical music. You are a human being. You are you, you can make mistakes. You are allowed to you are allowed to laugh. You are allowed to go besura. You are allowed to question. Please question your teacher. You're not allowed to question your teachers. Please question your teachers. You know. So I'll give you a basic example, Raj. Like uh, what happens is when you introduce a child. To Indian classical music, he's coming into a world of totally unknown parameters. He doesn't know what is sa, re, ga, ma. He doesn't know what is a, a, a. He doesn't know what is Sri Gananata. He doesn't know what is Maya Malav Garam. He doesn't know what is, uh, you know, Bhupali or Yaman Kalyani. You're just bombarding him with like too much information which he may or may not like. Of course, uh, about maybe 5-10% of the students may want to learn that. But I want to, I want to stay connected with with something which I already know. When I, when, I, when I hear something that I already know, I cling on to that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, so uh, it's, like, it's like taking a piece of paper and giving a child a, a pen and a, or a pencil and say, just draw anything. So anything, if not anything, he'll at least know to draw the mountain. He'll draw that sun. He'll draw that house over there or a lake flowing. He'll know that, you know. So you can cling on to that and move forward from there. I'll give you a small example is, every child knows, twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. Or, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. So, what are these? These are only notes. Okay. And, uh, I mean, to cut a long story short, any song can be broken down to its corresponding sargams. So it's like decoding it's like decoding a, a, a program into its corresponding binary uh, equivalent, you know. So anything, so the binary or any word can be decoded to its spelling, you know. So the spelling of Indian classical music are sargams. Okay. So now we make the uh, uh, student hooked on by already a tune that the student knows. So I'll play this tune for him. Uh, oh, I know, I know, I know. Twinkle, twinkle, little star. So automatically, I've grabbed his attention. Now I'll say, okay, now sing. 
So he'll sing. Twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. Now if I tell him that, you know, this has got sargams underneath, which is sa sa pa pa da da pa ma ma ga ga re re sa. So I'm just associating a known entity with an unknown entity so that he can cling on to that and learn this new thing. If I give him two new things, his attention span, I don't know what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. And I'm surprised that nobody thought of this. Mm. Any song, any popular song, you know, sa ni sa ni sa ni sa ga ni sa ni da ni da ni pa da sa da ma pa da pa pa. They all know kal ho na ho. They all know whatever you know, balam pichkari. They know all the popular songs. So why not use that as an entry into the world of classical music? Mm. And they realize, and and you should. you know when when you know we have done like hundreds of annual days and hundreds of programs with these tiny children so they are singing uh, whatever song and at the end of the song they sing the sargams of that whole song and you should just see the parents expression you know you just see that is oh my god how did this how are they learning this is is what they feel it's because because sargams it is a very deep world but you can't throw a big boulder at them you have to bring them in slowly through a through a, a known entity I think that the brilliant insight that you guys have had is that you're going to take a tradition that is steeped in kind of uh, a lot of respect, maybe a little bit of fear, and you're going to marry that with fun and things that people know, you know. And I think that yeah. is the deep insight. You've kind of married two things that generally, like oil and water, that generally weren't mixed together. Yes, yes, and, and you said and it. Use that, you know. That's brilliant. and you know if you kind of like extrapolate from it you could even think about breaking down all kinds of dances into indian traditional dances you know there you uh, go there you go yeah and, and say okay you you want to learn salsa you want to learn merengue or uh, ballet you know let's kind of start with bharatanatyam or something that you know correct like. yeah wonderful i love it okay uh, so here's another question this is uh, for the students who train for competitions uh, you know obviously that's more rigorous and advanced training is required uh the kind that typically happens in a gurukul uh with guru shishya parampara and everything uh, that part of it you know how do you get that online well you know it's just relentless pursuit and relentless practicing yeah uh, uh, raj would you believe it that uh, this you know we have an annual festival called sangam you know uh, which happens now it used to happen once a year now because of the number of students we have it twice a year so this sangam in spite of uh high level covid being there no classes happening anywhere but online 450 plus students performed wow as part of the and coordinated together you know there are pieces which you know the teachers the amount of i mean hats off to our teachers and and the way they go and train each one of them not only to teach them the piece as to how to sing it with feel with whatever make them understand that you're going to be with somebody and then teach them and then you know they record their piece they record their piece bringing everything together you know aligning them putting the oh my god humongous task mm-hmm. so online thing i mean these things are much easier when you do it offline you know because mm-hmm. you just but if you are able to crack it online yeah offline is going to be a piece of cake you know what i mean and and uh, and performing live i mean no uh, training them for you know live events and all it is the communication between the teacher and the student you know is that it is that uh, hands on experience that you have so whether it is online or offline you know you have you can in fact online you can record your thing and send it to the teacher 100 times and she or he will you know give give the student the comment the correct uh, correct kind of nuances the nuances he can record in a slower fashion send it to him he will re- listen to it 100 times or go back to that recording when you know like how we are having an interaction uh, uh you know and go back there and you know review what is it that the teacher said which is not possible in a traditional way yeah so that is like immediate feedback right because as you're listening to yourself later on recording it's kind of like a karaoke track i'm imagining it something like this yeah right? yeah you're you're uh, recording your voice on top of that then you know where you've made a mistake i actually completely agree with this you know when we started teaching online too 
everyone is a little bit afraid and they thought that this is going to be an impoverished version of it but there are some definite advantage of teaching online you know so when you record a lecture a live lecture it's gone right i mean you know you have to remember it and then you know what did we say there or you know you have to refer back to your notes here you can go back and listen to it listen to it again <coughs> listen to it in uh, slow speed or high speed or whatever absolutely wonderful yeah see we were very well aware uh, shridhar me that uh, you know a good good uh, teacher uh, is a different breed altogether you know just because you're a hip musician and you can perform and you can sing well that doesn't mean that you can teach and vice versa you know so so we have to look out that you know we have a, an exclusive teachers recognition and teachers training program where see and and with with me being uh, you know uh, or on top of the uh, the academy over there many a times the 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 agenda of the teacher joining the academy is totally something different mm-hmm. where he or she portrays something else you know in the beginning so that shridhar has become very intelligent at at recognizing that oh are you looking for a playback singing offer by joining this academy soon you'll be able to reach shankar mahadevan and then he'll give you a break in is that your agenda or do you really want to teach you want to be a playback singer fair enough you learn and you become a playback singer not uh, don't come here because you want to have a break with shankar mahadevan as a music composer that you can approach him directly so i had to disassociate myself as shankar mahadevan separately from shankar mahadevan academy so that was quite a challenge with the teachers that is a very strange kind of challenge mm-hmm. and then of course we need so many musicians but you know the temperament of a teacher as, as since you're also a teacher you might understand the main thing about teachers is patience you know patience perseverance and the ability to repeat yourself a million times without getting tired mm-hmm. and 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 maintaining that same enthusiasm you know because uh this is an academy that's running 24/7 it's it's on all the time classes are on all over the world so teachers have to repeat themselves so i tell this to my band members that you know hey guys i know that your your bo- you must be bored of listening to some songs like maybe a mitwa or you know maybe a, a kal hona ho or you know some other songs you must be, but hey every time we perform we have to perform as if we are performing for the first time we unless we show that enthusiasm yeah. uh, you know uh, you will not get that from the audience it will never communicate to the audience similarly the teacher every new student uh, he meets okay now what are we going to learn we are going to be learning sare the seventh step. so every time you mention you know that but you know you you can't act bored so this is a different there are a different category and and very very difficult to get a good teacher but fortunately for us we have a, an amazing bunch of teachers and they are truly an asset to the academy yeah this is wonderful yeah i can completely relate to the idea of having enthusiasm the 10th time that you're teaching something you know uh, yeah. so i'm here at bitsom teaching uh, classes and i have two of the same material classes two set different sections <laughs> repeating you know and 3 hour classes that too that's why my voice is a little bit oh my um, god yeah yeah uh, but it's you know that's uh, absolutely true because if you don't have that energy and enthusiasm then the students also they their energy is level sap you know yeah. and on the other hand if you are a good teacher and if you're passionate about teaching you will enjoy that you will enjoy it you'll yes. enjoy it even though you do 10 times you'll enjoy it because yeah. that is your first preference yeah. it's not about going out there and becoming a a popular singer or a you know a pop star or something like that if that is your agenda then you will not enjoy this yeah. in an academy which is so big almost 100 teachers you can't come with your own agenda as to how am i going to teach and uh, so i think there is got to be some kind of uniformity mm-hmm. as in the way you teach we are not even going to the other side of the fence where the students are we are talking about only teachers so we have a whole program only for the teachers we give them a teach kit and we are very very focused on the fact that you please follow the speech kit you don't try to do anything on your own or you know try you know then that that goes away this is given to you after a lot of contemplation after a lot of discussion after a lot of jamming with ideas you come to this please do this and it's divided equally you know and 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 the teacher has to follow that teach kit and the teacher also has to give a submission of what he or she did or did not do and how well and the teachers are also monitored as equally as the students uh, absolutely 
Wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, so I was going to move on to the uh, next question, um, which is this. Okay, it's uh, <coughs> it's about uh, inherent talent versus the role of practice and hard work. Okay, so what is your view of the relative role of these two things? God-given talent at one level, and uh, on the one end, and uh, you know, role of practice, which is, in your opinion, more important for success and mastery. See, uh, success has got nothing to do with both of these. Okay. Well, success, conventional success is one thing, but even in terms of kind of like, you know, improvement of skills. Yeah, that is a different thing. See, uh, uh, Raj, it all depends on how deep do you want to dive? Okay. It's your personal choice. It's not about with this much, will I be able to manage out there in the market, in the stage, in the this thing? You can manage. There are people who cannot sing beyond three songs and still they become hugely successful. That's a different story. But about a person being uh, born with talent, it is truly, uh, you know, uh, Ma Saraswati's blessings. If you're, if you're born with Sur, if you're born with the talent, if you're born with uh, the gift of music, it just helps you to propel forward in a faster uh, speed. That's all. Because it's like some people, they're blessed with mathematics. Yeah? You just give them formulas and they, it just connects. But whereas we look at it as if like it's Latin and Greek, we don't understand anything. So it's the same thing. It's the same thing. You know, everybody has got a particular temperament and, uh, uh, you know, attraction towards certain things. But on the other hand, only with this talent and, you know, uh, no practice and no uh, hard work, I don't think you can go, uh, you can go that far. You know, I think you need to have the correct combination of inborn talent with uh, with the correct amount of uh, rigorous practice and quality practice. You should know what to practice and uh, and you know uh, you know to master your art form. You know, this is an art form where it's not enough if you are just good. You know, you need to be excellent. Yeah, wonderful. I, I think it's a great answer. And uh, you know, uh, the, the thing that I'm getting from that is that pure raw talent will get you to be good, perhaps. But for you to be excellent, you also need to layer it up with hard work, and not just any hard work, but you you call it quality work, right? Identifying yeah. what it is that's stopping you from going to the next level, perhaps really working on it, breaking it down, singing it a hundred times, and then you know tackling the next problem and so on. Wonderful. Yeah. Okay, so it's often said that there are two states of music, one where you're just performing and the other in which you're in a state of flow. You know, it's no longer the case that you're even singing, but the sang song is happening through you. You're merely, merely the vehicle, right? It's kind of like this mystical state of flow. Um, uh, and the, the question is, what have you learned about being in a state of flow? Can you tell us something about it? You know, can you manufacture flow? Can you, you know, work towards it and get it anytime you want it? Or is it something that happens as an accident without your control? What can uh, you do? Yeah, I mean, the state that you're talking about, Nuraj, is a state that doesn't come uh, very often. It does happen. It, it does happen, uh, uh, you know, not that often. Uh, to reach that stage, you know, you have to be in total control of your of your musicality to begin with so uh, one is one is you you your your database your database of music is very strong okay now what is a performance now performance is you've got a ram up there with a million ideas over there you know like whatever 3 terabytes of sargams ragas, uh, songs, you know, compositions, everything that you've learned is there. It's in raw form over there. And you're on stage. Okay. Now, a performance is that particular moment, that nanosecond, out of that three terabyte data, you choose what is the one you want and put it out there. Okay. Now, if you have control over that full three terabyte data and your speed is excellent, you're able to access that at your will, you know, without faster than your brain can process, you know, something goes and it, it accesses and it brings it out. You know, what is the difference? I always quote this example of 
uh, uh, my great friend Ustad Zakir Hussain. What is it that makes him the greatest tabla player as compared to, you know, so many pundits who are there in the country? Now, the same example, you know, he's got a database of all the kaidas, all the rhythms, all everything is there in his head. But what makes Zakir Hussain Zakir Hussain is when he's accompanying somebody, what is it that he has to choose mm. from that database and put it out? The choosing this, number this, number this, number this. That choice is what makes you a great artist. You know, you're choosing the correct thing to say there. Now, you're doing this manually. Okay. When you I hope you're getting what I'm saying. I'm sure absolutely you are. getting huh? So, you're doing this manually. There comes a time when you are out of the picture. Mm. And it is almost like artificial mm. intelligence. It just takes over. I, there have been cases when I am singing and I am observing myself and I am saying, hey, is this what I am doing? How am I doing this? It's not possible. And when I listen to the recording back, how the hell did I do this? You know, you reach that stage. So this Let's process of choosing from the uh, choosing from the database and putting it out as an output, when that starts becoming uh, a thing which is not in your control and you're not controlling it anyway, something is controlling it. It's just automatically logically happening and things are happening where you you have you're attempting things even before thinking. You know what I mean? You are you. It's just a sound. You're uttering certain frequencies even before uh, kind of conceptualizing it in the brain. It's, it's faster than that. You, it's already out there. You're attempting things which are so suicidal almost mm. and it happens over there. It, it falls in place. Mm. So that is what is going with the flow. And it's very difficult to reach that stage but it does happen when you're there in the zone and everything is perfect. The sound is perfect. The band is perfect. Accompaniment is perfect. You're in the, you're in the perfect state of zen. It happens. Clack, that, that switch over happens. So that is what it is. Wonderful. Yeah, and I imagine that it's a little more difficult perhaps to get into the state of flow if there's a lot of pressure, you know, if you're stressed out or things like that. So some people yeah. might get into flow singing by themselves, you know. And, and yeah, absolutely. Like, no, no, you don't need it. Get, why can't I get this in the, on a stage, you know? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. What is the role of intoxicants in all this? I don't believe yet. I don't believe in in, 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 in uh, when people say that, oh, I have to get high to, uh, you know, uh, start thinking. But, you know, there was a there, there's a friend of mine called Dave Holland. He's a two-time Grammy, Grammy Award winner and a, and a, and a maestro, uh, you know, uh, in, in, in the double bass. He's the numero uno of double bass in the world, actually. And I performed with him for many, many years. So I was he was telling me about an experience where he lost his wife, you know, at a very young age. Uh, uh, when he was about 30, 40 years old and he was like completely getting into a very, very sad state and, you know, almost getting into depression and this, that and all that. So when Miles Davis, one of the greatest musicians of uh, all times, he called him and he used to play with him. He said that, you know, he, he told him a very beautiful thing as this sadness that you've got, na, you convert that into musical energy. You know, convert that into into something, a beautiful piece of music. Convert that into something that eventually becomes positive, you know. If you do that, it's easier said than done. But if you actually manage to do that, you know, the purpose of life will be something amazing. And he did it, actually. And he became one of the greatest bass players of all times. Yeah. I'm actually getting goosebumps, you know, when you're saying this. <laughs> Seriously. Very, yeah. And it's like, actually applicable across domains, not just music, you know. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. Of life, yeah. You have a problem or a challenge that uh, you've got. Uh, look at it from the perspective of whatever job you're doing, whatever dharma it is that you're put on earth for. And for me, it's being a teacher. Take that and then see how it is that you can apply it to your job. You know, in my case, yeah. what does it mean for my craft? And uh, how can I kind of channel that energy to become a better teacher and help these students and things like yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. Wonderful. As one gains kind of success in one one's field, right? Uh, and there are examples of people, and I think you're one of them, that you get to realize that you have other fields as well in which you could be proficient. So you start out <laughs> as a playback singer, and then you realize, hey, you know, I could potentially be a composer, and then a teacher and an online teacher, 
and partnering with the tech genius in order to kind of you know help students from around the world and things like that so there is sometimes a little bit of a tension you know and perhaps even a fear that look i'm already established in this one field should i go and do this other thing will it dilute my success in this field and am i spreading myself too thin you know um uh, how do you evolve you know uh, i think yeah i mean if you take yourself too seriously and 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 uh, you know you start uh, you know uh, analyzing yourself too much you'll never be able to uh, uh, you know kind of diversify and try to i think that zindagi ka nasha as you were saying na intoxication i think the intoxication should be from life yeah when you get up in the morning you want to say okay now this is interest anything should interest you everything should interest you for me everything interests me you know when when shridhar comes up with a new idea i am fully game for it it's shridhar i mean shridhar has got uh, he's he's got 48 different kinds of businesses running you know so it's like that it's just amazing so anything anybody comes up with even within the genre of music whether it is teaching whether it is anything i think you have to derive that kind of uh, uh pleasure from diversifying and i think just doing one thing i would have got absolutely bored just doing playback singing uh, or you know just waiting for one film song to come is is film song the only medium in this planet now in the last 2 years or 3 years we have realized that music is not about entertainment at all it's not about only entertainment there is such a bigger pur- it's a, it's got such a big purpose to it it's got such a huge kind of uh, uh reason to be you know not because i sang and you say wa 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 or and you pay me money that is one part of it you know but there are so many other things and we have we are changing lives here so you when you begin to realize all these things uska maza aur bhi aata hai you just start enjoying the whole process and you want to diversify you want to do so many other things the fear of the fear of failing should be the last thing that you should have yeah who is successful tell me one person who's got all his films as super hits or one hero whose all films are blockbusters including rajnikanth uh tell me one lyricist whose all the songs that he's written is a super duper hit or a music composer whose all tunes are accepted by you know 135 crore people from uh, from india it's not possible it's not possible so just be happy and if you're getting success uh, well and good but you have got to try various things and uh, and and you know go into uh, you know untreaded path that's great yeah so if you're playful and you're following your passion and you don't have a huge fear of failure and one of the ways to not have that failure is to just basically process uh, focus on the process you know not on the outcome yeah. so much then it will naturally organically take you down paths that will connect with you i think yeah yeah uh, awesome okay so in the answer to that question you were talking a little bit about you've realized in the last two or three years the purpose of music is not necessarily to kind of wow audiences or make money or be successful and you hinted on this a little bit so this next question is kind of going to actually elicit your more elaborate answer on that on that point which is you're doing a lot of work beyond the teaching aspect to bring the joy of music the healing power of music right to people yeah. so can you talk a little bit about that well yeah, i mean to begin with i'm nothing i've got nothing against making money to music huh? that is that is my bread and butter obviously <laughs> we yes. do that uh, very well that too but you know sridhar and me we have realized over the years that you know we can do much more and and the kind of as you were saying the intoxication the kind of intoxication that we get with what we are doing you know uh, raj we have a program uh, we have multiple programs uh, with uh, the shankar mahadevan academy and all thanks to sridhar ranganathan i mean ideas keep coming you can keep discussing but if you are a person who can execute that ideas and if you can bring that out and make it happen that is when you know you have achieved it and it's all thanks to him and our team of course but led by sridhar who made all these things happening uh so basically first thing is we have a program called the joyful choir now the joyful choir is uh a group of students who are in the autism spectrum okay now autism spectrum they respond to music beautifully other than even regular verbal commands uh 
they are so happy singing. We have a bunch of teachers teaching them. They perform for us, and they are most happy doing this. And uh, we have special courses where we are teaching them to sing, and they perform in a, a group. When 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 we have our annual sangam or whatever function or in a school when they are invited, so this this is absolute joy, you know, absolute joy. Uh, and and you are making a and look at the people, look at the parents, what they are feeling when they see their children on stage, you know, who they have kind of lost hope, you know, of what this kid is going to do. So they feel so good and they are happy about that. So that is the joyful choir. We said we completed ten years. Shankar Mahadev and Academy completed ten years. We have a program. We had a program called Ten for Ten, where we had ten different events focusing on ten different heads that we cover. So one of them is the Joyful Choir, where John McLaughlin had come as the as the you know chief guest, and every day we called a, a celebrity to come and witness this. So John and John G had come, and he heard them, and he was literally in tears, and you know blessed the children, and one of our students. Uh, Janvi, who's uh, you know who's a special, who's a special child. She's learning with us for many years now, and she is an amazing artist. You know, she painted and you know and gifted a painting to John McLaughlin, and that painting is there in the hall room of uh, this world number one guitarist. Uh, so the other program that we have was uh, uh, Muskurahat. Muskurahat is we uh, through uh, performances we raise money for. Uh, needy musicians because during the pandemic, you know, musicians like Nada Swaram players, for example, or you know, uh, people who play the uh, weddings, or you know, accompanying artists, folk musicians, they finished, finished, completely finished. <laughs> so anybody who's a musician, anybody who needs money, we are providing them with money. And what we're doing is we are not just giving them like a one-time thing, you know, like here is twenty-five thousand rupees and you know, bye-bye kind of a thing. Many musicians we are we have started with. A monthly thing, you know, four or five thousand rupees of a monthly uh, kind of uh, salary or a pension or whatever you can call it. So at least they know that their you know ration is being taken care of. Uh, you know, this is an amazing thing. You know, last month, uh, in one month, we did twenty five programs of Nirvana. <laughs> and the beauty about Nirvana is there is no agenda. Uh, we have approached every single NGO. Anybody you want a show, you want us to perform for your NGO. You want us to perform for your palliative care center. We are there. We'll come and perform. So our teachers, our students, and it is happening every day now. Every day, and it's so amazing. That's when we realize that music is not about only entertainment, or it's not only about glamour, or becoming popular, or in increasing your Instagram followers. Or you know, signing up with a brand—it's not that. It's got a—it's got an amazing purpose to it. So I, yeah. there's really one more question left, which is uh, the future. You know, so what's next for the academy? To the extent that you can even foresee, we've done a lot in the last uh, ten years, and always Sridhar and me—we always have this feeling that we have not even scratched the surface. We always feel that there's so much more you can do. There's so much more you can do. So much. Uh, I mean, we have not even uh, begun looking at a big, uh, you know, offline music academy. You know, you know, think of that—a mothership somewhere. You know, where we can say there's not a single academy in our country which we can say is of an international standard. Which I can say, hey, you have your Berkeley College of Music. We have this X Y Z College of Music here. Come and check it out. It's better than that. You know. An, an academy which has got its inf infrastructure, an academy that's got its latest equipment. So, you know, uh, a, a world-class academy which has got an infrastructure, which has got an ecosystem of music that we plan to do. So that is something that we want to do and, and achieve that in multiple places. And also, you know, possibly create multiple centers all over the country and take the online model to see you know see it's just the both of us we only put in all the money we only you know thought of all the ideas everything right from the beginning so now we can go to the next level where you know we can just exponentially increase now we have a fabulous ceo with us uh, shiv is there with us and and the team is just out of this world that we're very very lucky to have that so now we can go to the next level and i'm sure that this 
as a business and also as a as a tool uh, to reach out to many many people people the joy of music we can just grow exponentially uh, and and anybody whom we speak to they all seem to be enthusiastic and and uh, interested and also very happy to be associated with the shankar mahadev academy so eventually also another vision that we have is the shankar mahadev academy is eventually going to become the shankar mahadev world of art okay where music now you know learning just music has become just a part of the academy now similarly now this whole genre of music is going to become a part of the world of art where you know we're going to merge and we're going to cross uh, you know uh, uh, promote other forms of art in under one big umbrella for example a person who's learning singing does not mean that he doesn't like to learn painting you know mm-hmm. or dancing for that matter or you know yoga for that matter or so we want to bring it all together and merge it into a bigger uh, entity called the smr sma world of art and we want to launch it in 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 a lot of um, uh, you know countries abroad where you know countries are stro- showing interest because of my name and also you know our intent is very it's very clearly seen you can see what the intention is so we're going to do that and also promote our music globally to and have gro- global exchange programs where students can come and stay if you only we have an infrastructure we'll be able to do that you know so all these things we plan to do learn their music they come and learn our music and and create it like a global exchange program so wonderful yeah really uh, great to hear all this you know i live in austin texas at the macomb school of business uh, that's where i teach and we have a festival called austin city limits i don't know if you have heard uh-huh. I always yeah. think that it would be awesome to have some Indian, uh, uh, you know, musicians and composers come and uh, perform there. So uh, it would be such a great exposure. And I feel like in these live events, outdoor live events uh, in the U.S., uh, some of the kind of Indian film songs, especially film songs, would be so well received. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. That- something like that happens to at some point in the future yeah anyway yeah, it was yeah. a, it was great uh, i'm kind of like feeling very privileged and honored to have <laughs> had this kind of chance to talk to you and uh, you know a couple of times i myself felt a little moved you know with some of the things that you said uh, and uh, that john mclaughlin story as well of uh, story of jhanvi and things like that it's just amazing what you guys are doing thank you very much everybody for thank you raj uh, thank you thank you All right. So uh, I hope that uh, you enjoyed the session. I uh, definitely did, even though I was listening to the whole thing one more time. Um, really, really uh, enjoyed it a lot. Um, okay. So I'd like to start out by asking if uh, anybody has any questions about any of the things that came up in the conversation with Shankar. Uh, I assume that you guys know how to do this. You would just. Uh, type it in the chat box having said that i have to confess that i myself am somewhat unfamiliar with air meat so um i don't know exactly where the questions would come up i suppose they would come up in the chat box uh yes right it looks like uh it's probably going to come up in the chat box So if you do have a question uh, please do put it in and uh, while we wait for the questions to come up if there are any they don't have to be but if there are any um uh in the meanwhile I am going to uh, launch a poll and I would very much like to see your response to that poll so can we please launch that poll it looks like the poll is launched okay so uh, maybe the results of the poll will uh, come out in just a minute or two in the meanwhile uh, there is a question from ramnath and uh, ramnath's question is i would like to know your own that is my rajas view of uh, flow and how do we get into that state 
Yeah, uh, it's a very, very good question. Very important question, Ramnath. And uh, there is obviously a lot of work in this area. Well, I say obviously, um, you may or may not know about the work in the area, but uh, there is a lot of work in the area. And a lot of the work uh, is credited to a gentleman who just passed away a few months ago, uh, a gentleman by the name of uh, uh, Mihai Shikshan Mihai. Um, and he's done a lot of work on flow. And what he he found is that uh, you are more likely to get into this is just a quick summary of uh, his research so uh, you know um, we could spend a lot of time talking about this but the quick summary is that you're more likely to experience these states of flow if you have <clears throat> you have a high level of skill or knowledge and and shankar kind of referred to that right i mean he referred to this as the ram and you can uh, you have access to all kinds of things in your in your RAM. Uh, and that uh, database of things that you can access is uh, only built up uh, through um, practice. Uh, and of course, you, you could be uh, gifted, um, you, you could have inherent talent, but that alone is usually not enough. And that's what a lot of uh, findings of Sheikh and Mihai and other people also show. Uh, but you do need that RAM. So you, need, you do need a high level of skill in the area for you to experience flow states on a on a regular basis but that um presence of the database or having the skill alone is not enough it turns out that you also need to be put in situations in which you're challenged to just the right level not challenged too much uh even a person who's a master of what they do uh could sometimes encounter situations in which they're challenged too much either because uh they're not um uh feeling good maybe they're they're sick or they haven't slept well or you know there is anxiety or nervousness etc so the challenge has to be at the right level where it's not too much if it's too much then you feel anxious if it's too little that's not good either right you're you're put on stage and uh you have to now sing you know very basic songs for example you are an expert but you have to sing twinkle twinkle little star then chances are you won't get into flow so in in summary that's what um is required for people to get into states of flow. So uh, to just one one, one short line uh, to, to uh, summarize uh, my answer to that question. So how do we get into that state? Uh, you need to, first of all, have these skill levels. And uh, for that, you need to have practiced. And then you need to be lucky. And you know, of course, you can also do your bet to get into um, situations in which you're challenged to the right level. So that is the answer to that question. And let's see, is uh, the poll over? Um, I can, I guess I had to answer the question myself uh, in order to see the results. Okay, wow. Uh, I see that uh, the most popular response here is um, autonomy. Close to 40% of the people have said that that's the most important thing. Not so much the mastery. Um, belonging, I think, was second, but the poll has vanished from my end at this point. Um, yeah, so uh, it's interesting. Uh, actually, there's quite a bit of work uh, in the organizational behavior area that that shows that autonomy autonomy is very very important. Uh, so I'm not I'm not surprised that that's important. And I think during these COVID times, it turns out that uh, that's one thing that we're missing. We don't have a huge amount of control over what's going on, what's going to happen. We um, find it difficult to predict. Uh, you know, there's a third variant going on right now, Omicron. Who knows um, how it's going to evolve and what's going to happen uh, in the future, right? So in this current situation of great uh, uncertainty, uh, I think it's not surprising that autonomy is the one thing that people think is super important for them to be happy. Um, OK, uh, so Charles has a question. And maybe I'll take that question. And then after that, uh, perhaps we can end, because I don't want to take too much of your time. Um, what happens, Charles asks this question. You, can, you guys can see it, but I'll, I'll just read it out loud just in case. What happens when livelihood conflicts with life? Does happiness go during extraordinary times, such as pandemics, war, et cetera? What does history show? Um, 
Okay, so I actually think that these might be kind of two separate questions. So the second question is about whether happiness is possible during uh, and by extraordinary Charles here means obviously uh, times that are very tough, right? Extraordinarily tough, uh, like pandemics and war. Uh, so in times of war, people who are um, fighting in the war, obviously uh, a lot of times they do not have access to basic needs. And so, uh, you know, happiness goes down and it's not surprising. Basic needs are uh, needless to say, very important. If you look at the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, for example, the physiological needs need a need for food, clothing, shelter, air, water. Uh, these things are very, very basic. And if you do not have access to those needs, obviously you're, you're not going to be happy. Forget about being happy. You're not going to be even neutral, right? You're probably going to be unhappy. Um, and uh, the pandemic has posed a different kind of a challenge for a lot of us. I mean, it's not straight out war, obviously, where you're in danger of dying because somebody else is going to maim you. Um, for a, a subset of us, perhaps we do have the danger of um, uh, our health being affected and potentially uh, leading to fatal consequences. Or we have had people... Um, who have actually passed on, uh, people that we know within our own families um, or friend circles. And, and for that set of people, needless to say, the pandemic has been horrible, right? Uh, just like a war would be. Um, for most people though, we have done some surveys about uh, the sources of unhappiness during the pandemic. And uh, the most common source, it turns out, is uh, uncertainty about one's um, future and, and, and job in particular, job-related, career-related uncertainty, um, which I kind of mentioned briefly earlier too, right? I mean, one of the reasons why autonomy came out on tops is, is perhaps because uh, we are in the, in, the, in the pandemic situation right now. And uh, had it been just normal situations, uh, it's conceivable that something else in that list of four um, uh, would have been voted as uh, the top uh, source of happiness uh, in in work. Um, yeah, so in extraordinary times, it, it is difficult to, extraordinarily um, uh, difficult times, it, it is uh, very difficult to maintain happiness uh, because our basic needs are not fulfilled. And uh, in a pandemic like this one, I think that uh, the big need that's not fulfilled is the need for certainty that we all have, the need for control that we all have. Uh, the need uh, to feel like uh, we are the uh, authors of our own decisions. Um, that's important for us. You know, we do enjoy uh, being life being a little bit out of control sometimes. Uh, and we might even put ourselves in those situations, like, for example, uh, travel to an unfamiliar country, etc. But uh, that uh, only that happiness from being in those situations is dependent upon us choosing to put ourselves in those situations and things not being overly out of control. And right now during pandemics, this pandemic, um, for many of us, things are um, too out of control. Um, so with regard to the first question, uh, what happens when livelihood conflicts with life? Uh, I think that this is a very interesting question because right now I think that's the biggest dilemma or battle that a lot of um, governments around the world are facing. On the one hand, they want um, people to uh, be safe and uh, for COVID to not spread and for people to not die. But on the other hand, they also want people to be able to go to work and um, earn money and put bread on the table. And so it's a life versus livelihood struggle. And it doesn't seem like there's a very clear answer. Uh, but I would say that very quickly, I want to say that sometimes, you know, posing that question in that way makes it seem as if those are the only two choices. And I do think that there's a potential for us to continue to live our lives in a safe manner, in a relatively safe manner without jeopardizing other people's lives or our own lives by just following the signs, you know, wearing masks, social distancing, you know, being vaccinated and so on. And so uh, it's it's important to remember that we do have the choice of uh, kind of striking uh, kind of a middle ground uh, when it comes to life versus livelihoods. Well, thank you very much uh, to everybody for joining us. Uh, I really enjoyed it myself. I hope that you found it enjoyable and, and useful and uh, you liked it. And uh, I'll turn it over to the organizers of this. Thank you.
Thank you. Uh, thank you, Raj. Uh, and that's a wrap on the first day of the Ideas Festival. What a what a evening this has been. We are out of time, but I'm tearing my hair apart thinking about, wow, how many different insights have come. And more importantly, the need for me to find spaces in my calendar to internalize so many different insights. In the last session, especially the application of learning, research on learning, and the way in which it's been applied on different domains like teaching and painting, and, and this fabulous conversation that happened in the chat about uh, setting up something, uh, that's something that's come up very nicely and naturally. Many, many years ago, while I was doing basic theater, uh, I had a professor of theater uh, who taught me theater and he taught me one theory and that came up today and that's something that I wanted to speak about very quickly and he taught me something about the illusion of the first time and he said you will memorize your lines many times over but when you stand and deliver those lines they have to be as though you're doing it for the first time and when Shankar spoke about it I was so reminded of my professor coming and standing before me and talking about illusion of the first time and that is a prof the power that some of these professors have on us over many many years uh, and that's been ages ago but he just came before me as a visage and just to talk seem to talk to me. Uh, it's been a fascinating evening, and I am sure that I'm going to wake up tomorrow morning intoxicated, energized by all of what's come up today. But we've got to also remember there are three more evenings like this on the 15th, on the 22nd, on the 29th, all starting at five o'clock. Don't miss out on using the hashtag Beacon2022, and that's going to be the hashtag on Twitter on all other spaces. And please remember that you will get an email from us which will contain some snippets. And these conversations are going to be available for you to go back and revisit and churn many times over. Churning these are going to be important for us to internalize besides having conversations about this. Before we go, we have one request for you, from you. Just search out the emoji button right below there and let's have an emoji storm, so to speak. Just choose whatever emoji that you'd want to hit up. And just hit up, a, hit up a set of emojis that you'd want to go. So let those emojis go out to all the hard work that's gone behind the scenes. So many people from Professor Banerjee to all these faculty, all the students and everybody around who's been instrumental in putting this together and putting together many other facets of this, some of which we've been able to see on screen, much of it we've not been able to see because that's the quality of work behind the scenes that holds up something fantastic like this on our screens. And we're using the pandemic to pivot and bringing in world-class ideas to our own screens right in front of us. But it's important for us to carry forward these ideas and converse with people so that we are able to internalize them. And so when you go and talk to people, you never know where those conversations can lead us to. So stay well, stay away from the virus, and keep spreading good ideas. For now, good night. And we look forward to seeing you in the next session, which is going to happen on the 15th. In between, stay tuned to all the updates that are going to be coming up. So for now, signing off, we look forward, uh, we look forward to the next time where we'll see you and we'll have more conversations on a variety of new topics with a bunch of extremely interesting people. For now, thank you and stay well.